Welcome to another episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. If you're an investor, have you ever wondered, is it right to invest in commercial property? By this I mean offices, shops, warehouses. If you are thinking about that, you're not alone because currently there's a fad into commercial property investment. Now, I've been investing in commercial property for close to five decades now, so I'm going to give you some insights today as I chat with Brett Warren, National Director of Property at Metropole, about some of the benefits, but also some of the drawbacks of investing in commercial property. So if you want to know, is it the right thing for you at your stage in the journey? Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. Have you thought about investing in commercial property? You're not alone faced with the prospect of more moderate returns from their residential investors. I know some investors are considering this as an option. Now, there are also lots of blogs and now a whole lot of new gurus recommending you invest in commercial property. I think some investors are looking to diversify their portfolio. Others are looking for cash flow. So in today's podcast, I'm chatting with Brett Warren, National Director of Property at Metropole, about the benefits of investing and also, I guess, the drawbacks of investing in commercial property. Hi, Brett. Hi, Michael. Good to be with you again. And look, I'm equally seeing a lot of clients that are probably interested in focusing a bit more on commercial property at this stage of the cycle. And I understand why they're doing that. There's a lot of experts or so-called experts out there at the moment telling them commercial properties are the way to go. And it probably reminds me a bit, bit of a fad about you know the regional properties and regional areas and mining towns a number of years before that. So particularly at this stage of the cycle with interest rates higher, they're probably going to be attracted by that cash flow. I think that's probably the number one thing, that the stronger returns that it brings, you know, I guess potentially lower risk, exposure to different sectors of the economy, as you pointed out, um, diversification, different tax benefits, a good hedge against inflation, which is quite high at the moment, and also having, I guess, some leverage in the ability to add value, which I, I guess commercial property in, a, a, a lacks a little bit. But in that sense, um, you know, commercial property investment requires, I guess, a greater understanding. It's more of a complex kind of market. It's very, very different to residential investing. Isn't it? And yes. There's unique financing requirements. There's property management and leasing arrangements are very, very different. You've got to really get a good benefit of the, the potential risks, I guess. So I know you've invested in commercial property, Michael, for a very long time. So I'm, I'm interested to probably pick your brain a little bit as well. Well, I agree with you. A lot of people are heading into it, but I think they're doing it without fully understanding the implications. So thanks for selecting this topic today, Brett. I think it's going to be important to explain. And I probably started investing in commercial property too early in my investment career, Brett. Okay, why do you say that? Well, while commercial property's got strong cash flow, it's got much weaker capital growth than residential property. And in the early stages of my investment career, I really needed more capital growth to build the asset base. But I started investing in factories way back in the 1970s. Brett, I thought that's how the big boys invested, so I wanted to do the same. Yeah, do, do you still invest in commercial property today? Yeah, look, yes, I do. My portfolio is a blend of residential properties and commercial properties. I've got shops, industrial, warehouses, an office. In interestingly, I've even done a number of commercial, well, quite a lot of commercial developments in the 80s. And I've got my portfolio over a number of states. But of course, it's taken me five decades to achieve this sort of diversity. So maybe we can just start, like we've talked about the complexities and differences, maybe we can start by the by looking at discussing the difference between the commercial and residential property. Sure. Well, look, the main ones can be summarised like this. Commercial properties, yes, they do have a higher yield than residential properties. Now, in the good old days, you used to be able to get somewhere between 5 and sometimes even 10% net. That's net. In other words, the tenant pays all the outgoings compared to residential where maybe 3 to 4% gross, where you've still got to pay the outgoings, you know, the rates, the taxes, insurance. But a whole lot of, a whole raft of young and I guess inexperienced investors have been currently buying commercial real estate, but they've been using the same mindset that they use for residential real estate. They don't really understand what's going on. So what what's happened is they're getting three to four percent net yields and they've 
it's made made worse by this whole swag of new buyers overpaying for the commercial properties. A lot of the new buyers agents don't even understand how commercial agency works, so they're buying properties for their clients on such low yield. And I know, because speaking to commercial estate agents um, and some of those selling these properties, they're sniggering, let's be blunt, they're actually laughing at this. And I know experienced investors who've got more money and been around the block a few times are just can't un- understand why they're doing this. I've seen this happen before in previous cycles, but professional investors require a higher return, a higher yield from their commercial properties to make up for the relatively weaker capital growth for the longer vacancy rates and for the potential higher risks. Boy, I went on a bit, Brett, but basically, yes, you can under the old, good old days get higher yields. You're not getting that today though, Brett. No, and uh, look, high yields is a representative of, of higher risk as well. And if you're, you're not getting that high return, then the, it, you've got to really understand and, and decide whether the benefits and risks are worth it. Hey, that's a really good point. In other words, why do people require higher yield? Why do professional investors accept expect that and not accept the low yields? And it is because of the greater volatility in, in commercial property and the longer vacancy periods and the extra risks. For example, Though some people are comfortable, they like the concept that the leases for commercial properties are longer, often three years, sometimes five years, as opposed to the typical 12-month lease for residential property. And while some investors see that as an advantage, in today's market, we've got historical low vacancy rates. No big deal if we've got a short lease at the moment, is there? No, there's not. And I guess also, I mean, that, that brings with it in between, you know, obviously with inflation and things like that as well, but also in between tenancies. Um, you know, residential property, probably two to four weeks on average, but it, you can probably have those longer extended periods between leases with commercial property too, can't you? Oh, how often have you driven down the shopping centre and seen the full lease sign outside the shop or the office, even in good locations, Brett? And I'm not just talking about during difficult times. C- currently, still today, that's the case. Yeah. And what about rents, Michael? What about re- uh, rents as well? Well, rents are charged differently. So in commercial property, they're done basically on a square metre rate and rents are reviewed usually annually, sometimes 18 months in the lease. But the rent reviews, the upside of the rents is usually in line with the CPI. So yes, over the last couple of years, you may well have got 6 7% increase in rents, but over the decade before, it was more like 2 or 3% or less than 2%. Well, with residential properties, the leases are shorter and every 12 months or so, rents go up to market. And over the last couple of years, there's really been double digit rental growth, hasn't there? Yeah, it absolutely has. The next thing is the tenants. I guess the one thing about tenants, Michael, is the benefit of residential properties. Everybody has to have a home. Everybody has to live somewhere. So it's underpinned by home buyers. But the commercial industry, look, business does have to have a residence, but it's becoming less and less about floor space, isn't it? Well, it is actually very much because there's a lot more people shopping online. And so therefore, you've really got to be careful where you buy your commercial investments, what sort of properties you have. I mean, over the last couple of years, warehouses, industrial property has become the flavour of the month. I mean, we don't manufacture anything in Australia anymore, so things have to be brought in. But the average Australian knows what a house is, what an apartment is, how to uh, look for a good investment property, but but they don't understand what's required in commercial properties and often don't buy the right sort of property that's going to be in strong demand if their property becomes vacant in the future. There's also a lot of benefits as well, Michael. Um, You know, some benefits like tenants, the way they pay things? Well, the tenants pay the outgoings in commercial property. So, yes, they pay the rates and taxes and land tax on a single holding basis. So, if you own lots of properties, your land tax goes up on a sliding scale. The tenant doesn't have to pay for that as a disadvantage. And they also look after the premises usually they look after it well. So while residential tenants do to a degree, I mean, if commercial properties, if you think about it, it's where they run their businesses from. So they tend to look after it and often they upgrade them at their expense. And sometimes that means that commercial properties are a little bit less management intensive. Tenants don't tend to bother you for small items as much. But when things go wrong with commercial properties or rent review time comes or lease negotiations come, they actually require more intense property management, more experienced property managers. 
Yeah. We, we also spoke a little bit about um, the finance components and how things are different there. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, that's the big, big difference, which I want to explain to people, because that's why I believe for many beginning investors, commercial property doesn't make a good investment. Lenders usually only lend up to 70% of the value of your commercial or industrial property, which means investors need to come up with more equity for a commercial property. They don't give you the 80% or 90% or lenders mortgage insurance. And then to get a good commercial property, you actually need more capital. So while you can buy a good residential property for five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a fantastic one for less than a million dollars, an A-grade one for in the low $1 million ones. Sure, you can buy the, the local panel beater shop in the back street of a commercial area uh, for, for a smaller amount, but is that really the sort of tenant that you want? So to get good commercial properties, what you need to do is you need more money, A, because they cost more, and B, because the banks won't lend you as much. Unfortunately, what Unfortunately, what I'm seeing at the moment, Brett, is a lot of beginning and naive investors are buying cheap commercial properties that are really secondary properties, and they're going to have some real troubles when they've got to release them if ever their properties become vacant. Oh, you asked about finance too. The other thing is usually uh, interest rates on commercial loans are higher than for residential loans. Yeah. There is one type of loan for commercial properties called a lease stock loan that most people don't know about where if you have a good tenant and a low loan to value ratio and often that's got to be around 50 percent or so the banks will lend you purely on the income from the property and so for people who are stuck with serviceability issues the lease secures the loan but having said that as I said a moment ago you need to put a lot more capital in you can't do that at 70 percent and you do it at a slightly higher interest rate so you need to see a finance strategist who understands commercial leasing but I guess what that brings it down to is the fact that if you had, let's make up $500,000 as a deposit to buy a property, you could probably buy a $2.2, $2.5 million residential property. Now, you may not buy one, you may buy two properties, but borrowing 80% could buy you that much more property, while you could probably only buy a $1.5 million commercial property because the borrowing restrictions. In other words, if you compare one and a half million commercial property to a one and a half million dollar residential property, yes, you get higher yields, you get better returns in the short term, not as much capital growth. But if you look at return on funds, and that's how most investors don't think about it, if you've got 500,000 to invest, now you may not have as much as that. I'm just using it as an example because I can do this in my head, Brett. What you're going to do is end up with $2.2, $2.5 million worth of residential real estate rather than $1.5 million worth of commercial real estate. And boy, are your returns, your bang for bucks, your return on your money going to be much, much higher. And that's what we, when we sit down with our clients and do the strategic plans and map it out in our very powerful software, we can show them that for many investors, commercial property doesn't make sense because of the finance. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because you know, there's there's little numbers there around you know a four percent yield versus an eight percent yield, and you know six percent capital growth versus four percent capital growth it doesn't sound like a lot, but we've modelled this out over twenty years, and I think it was around more than a million dollars over a twenty year period. So, if you got a, a residential amount. property, you got better returns. That's that's correct, and you know I know we spoke a little bit about the vacancy periods and things like that as well. I guess one thing at the moment, like like every property. Um, there's a cycle. Where are we with the commercial properties with cycles and things like that at the moment? That's actually interesting, Brett, because residential property go through cycles. Of course, we know that. And that has a lot to do with supply and demand and interest rates. But commercial properties work on a very different cycle to residential properties. It has a lot more to do with the economy, the general economic factors, uh, with people spending. So when the economy is doing well and people are doing well and they're spending more, shops do better. At the moment, we know that the cost of livings, meaning that people aren't spending as much and you're finding that businesses are going broke, shops that have been around for a long time are closing up, restaurants and hospitality facilities are having difficulties. So you've got to understand more than just the factors that you need for residential if you're looking at commercial. You need a reasonably good understanding of the economy as well. The economy at the best of times is hard to pick. So <laughs> Isn't it? That's critical. And what about that? We did touch on the lease. It's obviously a much more of a complex lease. Yeah. So you're 
regular property manager would be able to do a residential lease. Commercial leases are much more complex and so we always use a solicitor to prepare them, even though I know some uh, property managers, some managing agents do. But interestingly, the value of your property is very much tied to the tenant, the lease, the lease renewals, the strength of the lease, and that's why I'm prepared to pay a solicitor to prepare my commercial leases. Having said that, sometimes you can even get the tenant to pay for that expense as well. I know a little bit about residential property, Michael, but I know very little about commercial property. Is it easier, is it less risk involved with with residential purchases and looking for residential property? Well, I think the average investor thinks they know about residential real estate, don't they? Because they've lived in a place, they've rented, they've owned one. And so we know that even that doesn't work too well because most investors don't understand the intricacies of what makes an investment grade property compared to just any property. And that's why they don't do that well in residential real estate investing. It's even more complicated for the average person to know about commercial properties And there aren't as many sites around. So you do your homework on realestate.com or domain.com or property update. There are now a few podcasts about commercial real estate, but not many. There's a few blogs about them as well. So in my mind, it's much easier to pick a top performing residential investment than a commercial investment. Having said that, we both believe that you shouldn't try and do it on your own. And again, for the average investor, you definitely shouldn't be looking for commercial property on your own, but be careful who you get to advise you on these because I wouldn't uh, trust a Porsche with a P-plater. Not that I own a Porsche, I own (laughs) other cars, as you know. And much the same with this, I wouldn't be trusting my commercial property investment to a beginning commercial buyer's agent. Brett, I remember a while ago, we actually had a client who came to us um, and he had initially engaged another commercial specialist buyer's agency and he showed us a property that was recommended to him and it was in a regional North Queensland city and I'm sure the buyer's agent didn't go out there because it would have taken a plane trip and a quite a long car trip to get to this little town. And while it sounded good, I just did a Google Maps thing online and did a street view, and it was a tin shed that was surrounded by farms, surrounded by paddocks. There was a reason why uh, you got a good yield. So even this so-called expert commercial investment buyers agency, boy, were they recommending a secondary property for somebody who had a budget of just under a million dollars. Boy, you could do a lot with that in residential real estate, couldn't you? Oh, most certainly, most certainly. Look, what are some of the disadvantages or negatives in investing in commercial property then? Well, we spoke about some of the positives, so I think it's good to just balance it out. So one of the disadvantages is lack of liquidity. Selling a commercial property can take longer, often quite some time, compared to selling a well-located residential property where in the current market you you can move it pretty quickly. Now, again, uh, it's very interesting because commercial properties, if they're vacant, take much, much longer to sell, while a house, if it's vacant, attracts owner-occupiers and actually sells easier than a tenanted property. I think one of the other disadvantages is, as I already mentioned, the lack of information, scarcity of information. Yes, there are some websites there in the Financial Review and other papers have some commercial property segments. Uh, Some of the large estate agencies produce regular reports. Heron Todd White, one of the big valuation firms, does produce a monthly report on commercial property around Australia. Uh, So you can get some information, but it's not as easy to interpret. And there's much more difficult to to get pricing information on realestate.com domain. You can get a reasonably good or definitely core logic indication of what a residential property is worth, much harder with commercial. And then, of course, as I said, the other challenge is the higher entry levels. You need more money for commercial property A, because a good one costs more, and B, because of the way the bank finances it. And so I think the real, real negative though, Brett, is the lower capital growth and the difficulty leveraging it, which means you don't get as good bang for bucks for your money. No, I think think that's critical, particularly when you're starting out, because leverage and growth and compounding 
you know, it's just going to it's just going to get you to that next one quicker and faster and, and build that wealth faster. And a commercial asset won't do that. Commercial assets probably more like the icing on the cake, isn't it? I agree with you. So it depends what stage of the game you're at. So you've got to understand the game you're playing, and that's the mistake I made. I played the big boys game when I first started and didn't get the capital growth in those properties in Dandenong Street, Dandenong. I actually even remember the number, 21 and 23 Dandenong Street, Dandenong, and they were led to a local furniture manufacturer. I think we were making things in those days back in the 70s, but I actually sold them. I made a little bit of profit then and I put the money into residential real estate. So by the way, at Metropole, we help clients with commercial properties. We believe commercial properties definitely have a place in your portfolio, but we actually map it out and plan it out. So capital growth first, and then they're very appropriate for people who are moving through the transition stage of their property journey as as they're now moving from the capital growth stage to needing income in their portfolio. They're also appropriate uh, in some people's self-managed super funds, Brett. Ah, we're not giving advice on that, but if you get the right advice, they can sometimes work. Yeah, and I think once once you've actually got to that level and got to that point, those higher entry costs and barriers, uh, they're, they're much more achievable and you know they're not going to hold you back. But um how are commercial properties value, Michael? I know that's a big one to talk about well, as well. Well, very differently to residential real estate. So residential real estate, you use com- comparable sales. You have a look at what was similar, a similar property in the street, in the suburb, and then yeah, if you've got a, a same sort of house, it would be worth the same. Maybe yours has got an extra bedroom, so you put a little bit extra on it. You adjust it for the differences. So comparable sales approach is what's used in residential real estate. But in commercial real estate, valuers and significant investors value them very differently. Of course, the naive investors just doing it based on, uh, oh, I got a 3.5% return on residential real estate growth, so if I get 3 4 5% net, I'm better off. doesn't work that way. Valuers use a number of different methods in it's a capitalization rate based on the income, but they also look at the lease, the security of the lease, the security of the tenant. Of course, if you had Woolworths or Coles or LD as a tenant, you'd be prepared to accept a lower return because there's more stability, a less chance of vacancies, uh, you've got long-term tenancies. So it depends upon your return the capitalization rate, which varies depending upon what interest rates are in the current market. So at the moment with higher interest rates, you can get more money just putting money in the bank, not that we'd recommend that. Therefore, you expect a higher return, a higher yield for your commercial properties. But in fact, people are accepting a 3 4% return on the commercial properties when interest rates are high at the moment. So the average naive investor is not doing it the way a valuer would value the property, Brett. No, it just doesn't make sense, does it? There's also very different market, I guess, dynamics and and drivers between residential and commercial also. Yes, there is. So residential uh, properties are valued depending upon the neighbourhood. The neighbourhood strongly influences at proximity to schools, amenities, and, and I guess market sentiment at the time as well. While commercial properties really, as I said, are valued based on the lease terms, the quality of the tenant, how if it became vacant, how flexible the premises are. And it really does affect the economic conditions. The general economy does affect the performance of businesses, your tenants, and therefore the way that commercial properties are valued as well. And as I said a bit earlier on, in general, residential properties are worth more vacant. In other words, you appeal to a wider range of tenants, while commercial properties are worth more when they're leased because it's the the rental return you're going for, and if you buy a vacant property, you're not really sure when you're going to find a tenant, how long it's going to take. And even if you do, in the current market, you often have to provide three months, six months rent-free just to entice the tenant to come to yours rather than the one down the road. Yeah, absolutely. Look, taking all this into account, I'm hearing it really depends on what stage of your investment journey you're at. But residential is probably generally more appropriate for most investors, particularly at the beginning of your journey. And I guess, as you said before, Michael, um, rather than just guessing and, and going off a hunch, I mean, at Metropole, we, we actually sit down and we can map these scenarios out. And if someone wants to come to us with a, a million dollar budget, we can show them the difference between commercial uh, and residential and work out if it is the right time to transition across to commercial or, or if it's more appropriate to have that high growth asset. 
Well, what you were saying is 100% right, but if they had a million dollars budget for residential, it's very likely that they'd only have a seven seven $750,000 budget for commercial because of their serviceability and also because of the way the banks uh, lend. So that little extra rent that you're getting, sure, that helps serviceability, but it actually doesn't uh, make up for the bank's higher interest rate and the fact that they're not prepared to lend you as much. So if you're considering getting involved in commercial real estate, I think it's best to actually have somebody sit with you, do the numbers, do the figures and show you. Because again, there's just like there's not one right residential investment for everybody, clearly there's not the right answer, commercial or in residential, industrial, shops, uh, wh- whatever, either. What you've got to do is sit with somebody independent who hasn't got a vested interest. And sure, that's a actually it's a shameless plug for Metropole because it makes no difference to us. We're not a commercial only buyers agency. We're not a residential only buyers agency. In fact, Brett, we're much, much more than the buyers agent. And I think that's what people listening to this podcast now recognize. We help our clients grow safely, outperform the market by growing their asset base. And then when the time's right, it may be for some people worth considering investing in commercial real estate. Now, how is your team, because you look after the team of Metropole, different? How are they helping people at the moment? Well, look, I mean, we're not rushing in to buy a property or one way or the other. If people are coming to us wanting to buy a commercial or residential, we're we're probably taking a step back and, and just, you know, I guess just checking that they're on the right course. Um, some people are, some people aren't. But if they're not, we can actually make recommendations strategically. One of my favourite sayings, Michael, is that numbers never lie. So if we can get the numbers right, we can get the information right, we can find out where they are, where they'd like to be and understand what that gap is and, and plug the information in, whether it be a residential or a commercial, and find the, I guess, the lowest risk but also the, the most efficient way to kind of get to their goals. And it's very, very different to just going to someone and saying, I want to buy a property. Definitely. So the property you eventually buy should be the physical manifestation of a whole lot of decisions you make and make in the right order. And that's what we do at Metropole. So I'll leave a link in the show notes if you're keen to understand what your options are, whether you're a beginning investor or experienced, and especially if you're an experienced investor and you want somebody just to look at your portfolio and see, is it going to get you to where you want to be? And that's what our powerful software allows us to do. Then we'll uh, be more than happy to do it. So just go to metropole.com.au. We'd love to have a chat with you. Brett, thank you very much. Um, I hope we haven't scared people off commercial property. All I wanted to do was open their eyes. No, I think you've done it well. Look, I've learned things there as well, Michael, from uh, from my brief background of commercial property, but um, it was very, very helpful for me, and I'm sure the guys found it interesting as well. Great. Thank you very much, Brett. Thank you. Obviously, you enjoy listening to podcasts, so I've got some great news for you. I've got another podcast you really must subscribe to, the weekly show I'm now conducting with Simon Kirstenmacher called Demographics Decoded, where we unveil the trends shaping your future. Simon and I share data-driven insights that are going to help you whether you're a property investor, a business owner, an entrepreneur, or just in your career and to understand what's ahead. Wherever you're listening to this podcast or watching, just stop for a sec and search for Demographics Decoded and please subscribe so once a week you get information from Simon and from our guests as well. Look, whether you're a business leader, entrepreneur or investor, our podcast is going to equip you with the knowledge you need to stay ahead of the curve because in my mind, demographics is going to drive our destiny, not just for property investors, but for Australia in general. We're in a rapidly changing world, so we're aiming to empower your business and investment decisions. You're going to get expert analysis from leading authorities in demography, economics and the future, insights into some of the trends that are going to impact your business and your investments, strategies for leveraging demographic shifts to your advantage. And once a week, Simon and I will give you some actionable tips. So demographics decoded, please stop for a sec before we continue on with this podcast and subscribe. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. Today, I'd like to chat about why some people aren't as financially secure as they could be. It's something I read in a great article by Morgan Housel, who writes for The Collaborative Fund. 
he started telling a story about a weight loss study. Now, what's this got to do with property investment and success? Listen in, you'll understand. He explained that the fitness industry is a $30 billion industry in the United States. Yet, despite that, almost 40% of Americans are obese. And he asked, how do you reconcile those figures? You could say a lot of people don't exercise, or they aren't exercising enough, or they aren't doing the right exercise. And all those three things are correct. Yet a group of researchers found a fourth reason why, despite such a big industry, the weight loss industry, the fitness industry, 40% of Americans were obese. And they found the majority of those exercising for weight loss either lose no weight or not nearly as much as they should. And the reason the researchers found is simple. Exercising makes you feel like you've accomplished something healthy, which you then rationalize in a post-workout food binge. While eating a pizza after sitting on the couch all day might bring guilt, doing it after you've had a jog, well, you know, that feels justified as a treat, doesn't it? A lot of exercise can be offset by a lot of food, of course. And that's what we do. And we do it because exercising gives us a license to eat more. These aren't small numbers. Apparently, food compensation seduces its way into 90% of exercisers' lives. And another study found that people fresh from the gym overestimate the energy they've used by up to 400% and ate more than twice as many calories than they'd just burned off. Something obvious but hard to deal with in real time is that exercise only works when its gains are cashed in. You can't measure the benefit of exercise merely by looking at how much you sweat, said Morgan Household. Okay, back to what's all this got to do with property and investing and money? I'll tell you in a sec. Because what he was saying was that the gap between what you gain and how much you avoid offsetting the gain is the figure that matters the most. So again, why am I telling you this? Because the same goes with money and saving money. Sure, wages haven't gone up much in the last couple of years, but over the last couple of decades, even adjusted for inflation, wages in Australia are at an all-time high. Having said that, the recent financial challenges many Australians have experienced because of coronavirus cutting back working hours or losing jobs has shown us that most Australians don't have much savings. They've got very little saved for retirement. So again, how do you reconcile those figures? I guess the same as we do with obesity. Financial well-being can't be measured merely by looking at how much you earn. The gap between what you earn and how much you avoid offsetting those earnings is the figure that matters the most. And even though the majority of Australians earn more today than ever before, it might not feel that way because the gains have been offset by higher spending. Look, just to generalise a bit, when I grew up in the 1950s, camping was an acceptable vacation. Hand-me-down clothes were very acceptable. Living in what used to be a nine-square home, 90-square-metre home, which is the size of a large two-bedroom apartment today, that was an acceptable size house. Kids sharing a bedroom, that was an acceptable arrangement. A tyre swing in the backyard, that was acceptable entertainment. Few of those things are acceptable baselines for any households today. The average new home now has more bathrooms than it's got occupants. It's got more TVs than it's got people in it, hasn't it? The average household's real wage gain over the last half a century has just been spent. The household savings rate fell during a period when income rose. Now, you can't blame people for this. Spending more when your income rises is as tempting as eating more after exercise. It feels earned. It feels justified. And this is doubly true for spending because people's lifestyle expectations are driven by others, their friends, their peers, the people around them. When everyone else spends more, you you feel entitled to spend more. But all savings relies on the ability to receive an extra dollar and say, I could spend this, and spending is great, but I'm not going to. It's the same as turning down a big meal after exercising. And believe me, I know it's just as hard. I have difficulty with that too. It might seem obvious that savings is your ability to reject what you could spend, but the majority of financial goals are about earning more, better investment returns, higher paying career. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Earning more is wonderful, just like exercise. 
you just shouldn't lose sight of the fact that earning more will do little to build your wealth if every dollar is offset by spending another dollar. The world is filled with the financial equivalents of athletes who finish every workout with four Big Macs. Wealth at every income level has less to do with your gains and more to do with your ability to leave the gains alone without cashing them in. So, reading Morgan Housel's article, three points stick out. Learning to contently live with less has the same effect as growing your income, but it's often easier and you're more in control of that. Another lesson is money is often a negative art. It has a lot to do with actions you don't take and things that you avoid. And the third lesson is everything has a price. And prices aren't always clear. The price of exercise isn't just the workout, it's avoiding the post-workout appetite. And it's the same in money and in finance, isn't it? The price of building wealth isn't just the trouble of earning more money, it's about avoiding the post-earnings urge to spend what you haven't accumulated. So Morgan Housel is a great author at Collaborative Fund. He writes some very clever things about behavioural finance because it's the way we think the way we treat money that decides what our financial situation is going to be in the future. I hope you got something out of this and you've learned some things about the way you spend. Remember, wealth is what you don't spend. Thank you for spending the last little while with me. I hope you got some benefit from this show. Hey, but before you move on to the next podcast you're hoping to listen to, please let me remind you that I have another show that I produce once a week with leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher that we call Demographics Decoded, where we unveil the trends that are going to shape your future. This is a must-listen-to podcast for anyone interested in property investment, business, or entrepreneurship. So if you don't currently subscribe to Demographics Decoded, please stop for a second and subscribe on your favourite podcast app or on YouTube. Now, if you did enjoy today's show and you know somebody else who'd benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast and Demographics Decoded. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there are three little buttons at the top of the player. Or just talk to them, tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour. You're definitely going to be doing me a favour in helping in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, you can catch up with me in between these shows on social media, or you can join my private Facebook group. Just go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I've got a special bonus for you to say thank you for subscribing. Just go to podcast bonus.com.au. There's a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where I've got a bunch of ebooks and reports. That's my way of saying thank you to you for taking the time to listen. Oh, by the way, if you haven't listened to the many, many podcast episodes we've already got, we're well into our 600s of episodes now. You can always listen to the old episodes which each have lessons about property investment, success and money. Once again, thanks for listening to today's show. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?